ladies and gentlemen. So I think you had enough uh, introduction about me, and it is so nice to see a lot of familiar faces after a long, long time. Uh, I would like to straight away jump into the program, but uh, before that, I will just explain where we are. Uh, actually, my university is in Queensland, and this is the state capital, and we are 680 kilometers north of Brisbane, and this is the main camp uh, location of our uni. We have four campuses, uh, one up here, Mackay, and one there in Gladstone, around here, and Uh, and Sydney and so on. So, <clears throat> I think you all can recognize this one. This is the Great Barrier Reef. If you would like to visit, please visit me. I will take you there. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> if I introduce my uh, research work, it took more than five million years for the apes to develop into the modern day mankind, but it took only 50 to 75. Thank you. It took only about 50 or 75 years for this happy family to be transferred into this happy family thanks to these things so this is a huge problem in the developed world and it is a serious problem developing in developing countries as well so we need to do something to either to stop it or at least to reduce the tendency of this kind of thing. This is the most uh, serious health threat in, for example, US, mm, Australia, New Zealand. This is being considered as one of the most dangerous health threat in the future because obesity, as you see, is kind of man-made or you can define it as a kind of non vigilantness of people about their food habits their exercising habits and their lifestyle to bring them back to the track you need to do some sort of thing but unfortunately regular testing is the, the regular testing is pretty expensive if you take uh, pre the standard testing. So what is meant by the continuous health monitoring is making sure that you are within the permissible limits of certain biomedical parameters. The very basic three are the blood glucose, blood cholesterol and the pressure test. The pressure test is fine because you don't spend any money on testing compared to the other two. The other two involves with a lot of consumer, uh, sorry, uh, consumables or the disposable sensing tips. Therefore, the regular testing is unaffordable for the people who are most vulnerable to the obesity, the disease obesity that comes with the junk food those who are vulnerable to that are the low socio-economic sector of the society. Those who are getting higher wages, they don't go for junk food oftenly. They really consider about the fat content and all, and they choose their food, and they have the <coughs> affordability for that one. Those who are going for junk food in Western countries are the low socio-economic sector, and at the same time, they can afford for regular blood tests and things. That's why we are working on developing low cost blood testing and uh, blood glucose and uh, blood cholesterol testing. So
So these are the two most expensive among these three. Here the testing equipment is expensive, but every test it doesn't cost it. It's only the consuming uh, power. But in these cases, every test it involves with the disposable sensor. Usually, I don't know the price here, but in Australia, a hundred strips pack, pack of hundred strips comes to sixty-five dollars unless it is subsidized by the government. Government cannot afford to subsidize for low socioeconomic sector continuously because the government need to fund other sectors of the health from the same budget. Therefore, it's a real struggle for the government to support those who are in the marginal levels. If you go into the diabetes conditions, it's very difficult to get them back. But if you can track them before they're heading into that region, and if you analyze the trend and get them uh, notified that you are heading for this, so that the doctor and the other health professionals can advise them to change their food habits and bring them back to the normal region. That's the main uh, focus of my research. So I work on glucose biosensors. The cost of the sensor involves two factors. One is sensor manufacturing and the other one is sensor electronics. If you can manufacture the sensor, the disposable sensor strip for a low cost, you can cut down one part or one portion of the uh, measurement and the other one is sensor electronics. If you can develop the biomedical instrumentation required for this one for low cost, that will bring the total package. For that one, you need to have a sensor which gives a high, which can give you a higher sensitivity. That means for a very little change in the measurement, it will give a higher current or higher voltage or whatever is the uh, measured parameter in the instrumentation system. If you can develop a sensor responding into that way, you can break down the sensor electronics cost. For low cost sensor fabrication, the trends are changing the substrate materials. I will come into this one in a while and changing the fabrication procedures and the uh, substrate and the uh, enzyme deposition procedures. I will explain them all in a minute. First of all, I will explain in brief what is a biosensor. A biosensor. It's a device where you get parameters like them, uh, H2O2, glucose, cholesterol, urea, whatever it is, in a fluidic media. When they come into contact with your sensor, biosensor, the biosensor has either an enzyme or an antibody or something like that, which transduce a signal from this parameter into a measurable quantity like current, voltage, temperature, optical or whatever it is, which you can measure from biomedical instrumentation system. This device is called a biosensor. So in this research, mainly I am focusing on glucose biosensors. So we will see what glucose biosensor is. In glucose biosensors, we measure the amount of glucose in your blood and it is not a direct measurement like if you go to a lab, it's a different procedure. When you go to the lab, lab and give you a blood, they do chemical testing on your blood sample. But when you use a portable uh, handheld meter with a disposable uh, sensor strip, this is the method we use. There, the amount of glucose in your blood and it always the blood has oxygen and this is every uh, biomedical parameter has its uh, linked enzyme which converts that into a 
different product. When glucose and oxygen come into contact with glucose oxidase, the enzyme is glucose oxidase, it produces gluconic acid and hydrogen peroxide. And this hydrogen peroxide, through a electrolysis process, you can separate it into oxygen and two, two electrons. If we can collect these electrons and measure how many electrons produced within a given time, then we can reverse calculate and give you the amount of glucose in your blood. That's the procedure happening behind the screen. So in a biosensor, all these parameters, for example, the linear range, uh, uh, reproducibility, sensitivity, lifetime, lifetime means the shelf lifetime of the sensor strip, stability, size, response time, selectivity, they all matter, matters the most because if you can get all these things at a very high price but you won't be able to find many more customers for that product. That's why we need to produce something at an affordable cost. That's the whole point of uh, this research using nanotechnology to reduce the uh, production cost of the sensors. These are the common type of uh, blood glucose meters you might see in the market and this is the sensor strip I am talking about and the same principle is being used for common environmental monitoring systems. They can measure different parameters in soil, water or air, pollutants and anything which is in the either in liquid form or vapor form, you can measure them uh, using the same principle. In common enzyme immobilizing matrices, uh, the principle is we develop a sensor which has capability of loading the enzyme and stably leaving it in the shelf for a certain time period, that's the time it leave the factory and come to the customer, maybe six months. So that's the shelf lifetime. During that time, it needs to retain the enzyme because the enzyme is a kind of a living, uh, I can't say living, but it uh, very close to a living organism. If you go out of the temperature range, it decays down, the uh, performance goes away and it won't respond. And if you go for higher humidity or some other condition, again it dies down. So you need to keep it within the permissible range for every parameter of concern and enzyme bit of a tricky thing that means the cost of the total sensor production involves with the substrate material what's the substrate you use to load the enzyme and enzyme immobilizing uh, method these are the sorry these are the traditional ones noble metals usually gold or platinum or a hydrogel, inorganic materials, carbon and other uh, carbon composites, maybe graphite, glassy uh, carbon. But in my case, I use conducting polymers. I know most of the electrical engineers, when they, they heard the word polymer, usually it's a very good insulator. It? But it's a nice story. I will take two, three minutes out of my time to tell you that. In mid, if my memory is correct, it's either early or mid 70s, uh, in a Japanese university, one foreign student from Korea was asked by his Japanese professor to make a particular solution, and the professor gave him the recipe for the experiment. 
but I don't know who made the mistake, whether the professor made the mistake or the student made the mistake. Instead of uh, millimole solution, he utilized almost all the stock in that lab. Three order difference. And as he went on, he wrote everything in his experimental book. And at the end, he got a thick something he never expected to see. He's an intelligent guy, and he realized that he made a mistake and went through his calculations and found that he made a serious mistake, finished all the chemicals in the lab. <laughs> it's a fundamental mistake, never expected by a professor from a postgrad. He left everything and left on the table, including his experimental book, and left the lab and never returned. Professor was waiting for him to re reply, I mean, uh, as he didn't come, Professor went to the lab and found that he's not there and asked the other students what happened. He was busy. Uh, he left somewhere. And then Professor has gone through his experimental book, lab book, and found that the, he has made a mistake, but he was interested about the solution, what was in the test tube. Then he has taken that one and experimented. 30 years later, that gave Professor Shirakawa the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in year 2000. That was the conducting polymer. So that unfortunate Korean guy, I didn't know, he didn't ever claim that he made that first. But, luck, but it's not only the luck of Professor Shirakawa, he worked for 30 years. They all three shared the Nobel Prize for year 2000 for chemistry for the finding conducting polymers. I think you all are using that. Those who have the modern cell phones and all with oil LEDs, organic LEDs, that's the background story of that. The conducting polymers. Another word for that one is organic semiconductors. That's where we get the uh, rollable and flexible. Uh, screens and all. So it is compared to the ITO based uh, the solid screens like these, their background material is indium tin oxide, ITO. Compared to ITO, uh, it's pretty cheap. All with uh, ITO fabricating and putting the circuit on that one, it's pretty expensive so that you can use uh, printing methods and other things for the organic semiconductors, so it drastically bring down the cost for the same thing. That's why organic LED is becoming popular. So we use the same thing for our experiments and I will explain why in a minute. So the current trend is to use nanostructures and nanoparticles for improving the enzyme immobilization in the sensors why? Because the amount of surface area matters a lot. Capture higher number of enzyme molecules. If you have a flat surface, you can have a certain amount of enzyme put onto that flat surface. But if you have a corrugated surface, in 2D, you will see it as said one centimeter by one centimeter, but if you have a corrugated surface, then your effective surface area is more than one centimeter by one centimeter because you have the uh, pictures on the surface. We use that technique and I will explain how we did it. Uh, this is the symbol for polypyrrole, this is the pyrrole monomer and upside down in alternate ones. Uh, I'm not going to explain to you how the uh, pyrrole becomes conductive. It's a little bit of uh, boring chemistry for the engineers. But uh, they have pi electrons uh, common in two adjacent cells. They are sharing with each other. And when you dope it with a donor electron from another molecule, it becomes conductive. Say, for example, uh, different 
you, you can put, depending on your requirement, uh, NADF6 is one of the common, uh, sodium hexafluoroposphate is one of the most common uh, doping agent for. Uh, the main reasons for selecting polypyrrole as my uh, substrate material is easy and fast fabrication because I can do fabrication in electrochemical methods, uh, easy thickness control, good conductivity, and one very important thing is biocompatibility because I need to put, a, put an enzyme, it's a biomaterial and the substrate should be biocompatible. This has a very good biocompatibility and good stability under atmospheric conditions. This is another one important thing because we need to have a longer shelf lifetime, otherwise we have to dispose the product soon after produce. So these uh, uh, scanning electron micrographs of different uh, polypyrrole <laughs> surfaces we made under different experimental conditions. Uh, I will take a couple of them later and show you what are the conditions we used. And uh, you can see, say, this distance is one micrometer, and these are the nanometer levels. Say if you take this one, again these uh, chains, the size of width of the chain is in nanometer level. But still it is not good enough for our purpose. I used a membrane as the template for that one. Now, this one is a commercially available uh, filtration membrane called anodists. Unfortunately, they have stopped production, but you can find similar products from other companies. This is from a company called Milipo, who lead in the market in the filter products. And they produced uh, average pore size 200. This is, I think, one more, yeah. This is the 200 nanometer pore size one, and they produce another one with 100 nanometer pore size. I use both of them as my template material to make the surface, effective surface, how we have done it. And this is the enzyme, glucose oxidase, and these are the dimensions. So, uh, if we take this as the plan for the membrane, these are the holes, these are pass through holes in the filter membrane and if you take, this is the cross section, so this is the surface I showed you earlier, the plan view and these through holes are there and this is alumina, L2O3 and if you put it in a plasma screw develop a platinum layer on top of this one, there will be a thick layer on the flat surface and there will be a thinner layer going into the hole like this because the, the platinum comes from this platinum target from there, this, is, this happens under high vacuum and at a higher voltage, when the platinum particles released from the ta uh, target, they fly <coughs> randomly and land on the flat surface. Those who escape the flat surface here, going through the, the thickness diminishes as it goes down. This is a first step, alumina and the platinum layer, then we electrochemically deposit a polypyrrole layer on top of that one. My apologies for the colors, it worked fine on, still worked fine on my laptop, 
it may be difficult to see from back side of the theater. But anyway, uh, polypyrrole is the instead of putting them on the flat surface, now I have made nanotubes because this is the cross section. So I have made nanotubes of polypyrrole using this template. We will see whether it actually happens in a minute. Uh, this is the method I used. I use the working electrode as the polypyrrole is deposited on this one. This is the working electrode, platinum is but an uh, anodist and a reference electrode and a counter electrode. This uh, counter electrode is platinum and reference is a standard AGAGC electrode. This is the point around 0.8 uh, volts and stay constant for a particular time and we again did a couple of experiments for tuning the most effective time and this is another scanning electron micrograph or this is a 2 millimeter this scale is 2 millimeter and you can see this is the angle view of the cross section you can see the polypyrrole has grown inside the cubes and these are 200 nanometer cubes going past through the membrane and this is the top surface this and this is the surface area after developing polypyrrole layer for 90 seconds and this is the one for 900 seconds you can see the sensitivity results we got for different uh, material, uh, sorry, different uh, times of deposition, and we found that 90 second is the best we can get. This is completely covered, and it's after 900 uh, mil uh, 900 seconds. It looks like only nano pits, not nano tubes. So, in 90 seconds, we got very good. nanotubes in uh, this one and this is the surface area uh, with this is not the electron um, microscope image this normal uh, image of, uh, from a camera uh, this one is masked and deposited and we make uh, one centimeter by one centimeter layer and put a uh, insulator layer here to stop the polypyrrole developing on this one as well because this is again uh, deposited platinum. So finally we make one centimeter by one centimeter PPY oh. glucose oxidase entrapment was first done by uh, physical deposition we just drop them uh, 2 milligram per milliliter uh, into onto this one and dry that 4 degrees centigrade for 30 minutes and washed in uh, phosphate buffer solution and it worked fine and this is the happens when you have this is glucose and when you have oxygen and glucose oxidase there it makes gluconic acid and hydrogen peroxide if you have more glucose oxidase you can get a higher current here because the two electrons coming out from this reaction, we collect them and measure it as the current. So there is there are a couple of ways to improve the current 
uh, getting higher sensitivity. One is improving the amount of glucose oxidase or improving the size of the sensor. Uh, unfortunately, you cannot increase the sensor tip size because when it becomes bulky, it is un uh, inconvenient for the user to use. So, only way is improve in the amount of glucose oxidase loaded into the same area. That's why we use this method and this is the test setup and this is the uh, electrochemical measurement system, uh, fabrication and measurement both done by this system. And uh, we added glucose into this phosphate buffer solution in known amounts and measured the current in time uh, with respect to the time and recorded that. So, point 0.5 millimole of glucose into the solution. Uh, this voltage was set by Pre, uh, previous experiments on doing cyclic voltammetry basically to get the best operating point for the uh, reaction. So we get instant jump in the these are the points where we added the glucose into the solution. So you get a very quick response and it's getting stabilized. Just to compare what happened nanotube array electrode. This is a, this is the response what we get from a planar surface. The most common planar surface you can find in a lab is the ITO, the indium tin oxide, which we use to make these screens. That's even if you put it into a electron scan, electron uh, scanning electron microscope, you cannot see any difference. It's so, so flat. So we use that one as the conducting substrate with uh, platinum sputtered, the same amount of platinum sputtered on this one, and polypyrrole deposited, and these are the responses. High sensitivity into glucose. Why it happens, as I mentioned earlier, this is the normal one. If you have a hole and polypyrrole deposited inside the, within inside the uh, tube, you get more and more glucose molecules getting entrapped into the polypyrrole network. That's why you get a higher response here. To experimentally see it, we dissolved this one in, you can dissolve the alumina in sodium hydroxide in very low concentration, 0 0.01 or so. Polypyrrole nanotubes developed into the membrane, right? Once this side, this yellow color part is dissolved, you get only this brown color part and this green color part. So these are the tubes, the green color one. This is actually not up to the proportion. This is much, much longer there. That's why you can see them very long. See, this is one micrometer, sorry, uh, <laughs> two micrometers, and you can see them up to maybe 30, 40 micrometers or even more than that. So if you take these two, you have increased the effective surface area. Earlier it was pi r squared. Now it is 2 pi r h. Get an increasing <coughs> factor of 2 h by r. And if you have a pore density of 50 percent, that means you have flat surface 50 and the whole areas, the pores, top area, 50%, then you get this one. It's normal. It's the uh, 
sorry, uh, S naught is the surface area of the flat surface one, and S n is the new surface area after introducing the pores. So you get these ratios for different uh, pore densities, and after calculating, you can get nearly hundred to thousand time increment in the surface area. That means that much of <coughs> glucose oxidase you can. This nanotechnology has helped us improve in the sensitivity of this uh, <coughs> sensor while keeping the uh, visual physical size at the same. You don't need to increase the visual the physical size, but inside that object you make holes and get area from there. So, in this one, uh, we have obtained in the 100 nanometer one, we got uh, 7.4 milliampere per centimeter squared per mole uh, sensitivity, and 200 nanometers we got uh, 3, and the response time is 0.5 to 10 millimoles, and this works from uh, 0.5 to 13. This is more than enough for. Or blood glucose measurements. Then, in the next step, we need to check this for the sensitivity or the signal to noise ratio of this one, the selectivity of this sensor for other things. <laughs> if it responses for, say for example, ascorbic acid or uric acid which are common components in your blood that will give you an erroneous, uh, erroneous reading so when we plot it this is the calibration curve and it gives uh, this is I'm not going to explain all these terms this is called the Michael S. Menten constant. 7 is a very good value for a biosensor. So it's again within the uh, acceptable range. And I max is 108 and 200, uh, sorry, uh, 120 microamperes for A1 and A2. A1 is the uh, 200 nanom uh, nanometer one, A2 is the 100 nanometer one. So lowest possible measurement. It was 30 micromole and these are the results we got from that. And this work was done in uh, I think 2007, 8, 7 I think, yeah. <laughs> At that time, this was the top in the published uh, ones. We had 7.4 for A1 and uh, 3 for A2, and these are the other comparable ones in the published research data. Then we did another experiment with the same thing, changing the absorption method, the methodology which we used to uh, deposit the glucose. Substrate. Now the next part is uh, how to put the enzyme onto that one effectively so that we can retain more and more enzyme molecules on the uh, substrate material. First one, what we did was uh, physical absorption, just drop casting, and the next one, uh, co entrapment. We put a little bit of glucose oxidase into the monomer solution and did the electropolymerization? So some of the molecules get entrapped in the chain while it is fabricating. Then add another layer. So a two-step method. In the two-step method, we did this one, and on top of that, we did So these are the results. And
Kani. Two step method gave very uh, high jump, smooth high jump, and uh, becoming stable very soon. This is the sensitivity and the response time, the physical absorption, or entrapment, and the two step method. But unfortunately, here, inside the chain, so they take more time to react to the uh, glucose. The next problem is the denaturization of enzyme because it's a living particle, it needs to be in the correct uh, temperature and other uh, temperature, humidity and other things in the range of that. And we try to uh, do some sort of thing in this step. We noticed that sensitivity was reduced by more than 50% in two weeks in our previous experiments. So we need to do something if we are going for uh, production type of thing. But unfortunately, we didn't have any serious chemistry in our team. So let's see what the other people have used for other uh, enzymes and all. And we found uh, glutaraldehyde is the best uh, cross-linking agent. Uh, and applying that, 5 microliter of glutaraldehyde, 0.18 uh, percentage was placed on the electrode in the uh, physical absorption and then dried at 4 degrees centigrade and this is a curve we got after that and in this method it increased it into 62.5 and in total glucose nanobiosensor using polypyrrole and it was published in the top journal in this field biosensors and bioelectronics and this is the response curve set for different concentrations and this is the test for aging even after seven months it retained 3.5% uh, of the original sen sensitivity if we calibrate this one as 100 and still this one is more than enough for our uh, instrumentation system. So this is uh, response time 6 seconds. So this is the comparison of our results with the others at the same time and you can see the clear difference the nanotechnology has made into our research. Again, in the next step, we went for further cutting down the cost rather than using the, the template material what we used is pretty expensive, the uh, anodic filter membrane is pretty expensive. So I thought of get rid of that one and using only uh, chemical deposition method. So I use conventional methods, we use a lot of platinum and I reduce the platinum usage and use conducting polymers and electrochemical deposited. These are the ones. What we did was I got uh, the same electrochemical deposition system. Earlier what we did was let the current go for 90 seconds continuously but this time we started pulsing it. The theory behind that, when you start the electrochemical deposition, it randomly start from the low in contact with the 
Pyrrhal Monama, dubbed with uh, NAPF6. Theoretically, it should have the same surface res uh, interface resistance, but due to practical reasons, it has different interface resistance in different locations. So it starts developing the first nodules at the lowest resistance place. And it starts growing out of that continuously. But if you interrupt the current flow, then the growth stops. And when you reinitiate that one, now the interface resistance has gone It was the uh, platinum sputtered electrode and the monomer. Now, some of the places are surrounded by polypyrrole nodules, and the res uh, interface resistance between that nodule and the pyrrole monomer is much more than the resistance between the interface resistance between the platinum <coughs> surface and the liquid. So it starts a different nodule formation in the second pulse. This pattern repeats for every pulse and it starts different different islands of no corrugated surface. This works very well and sorry. This, these are the size differences with the uh, mark to space ratio difference in uh, deposition. So you, you can see clearly when it is continuous in this pattern and sorry, when it is continuous it is this pattern and first uh, 2 volts 0.5 second and 0 volt 1 second this pattern and this one. So we found that it's 0.5 seconds on, 0.5 seconds off. To test that the effectiveness of the corrugated surface, we again used the most flatmost surface which we can find, that's the ITO substrate, the uh, it has glass substrate and uh, indium tin oxide deposited on one side. After platinum deposition, it get a 50 nanometer of a platinum layer on top of the ITO layer, so that we can develop the uh, polypyrrole on top of this one. This is a schematic diagram of the experimental setup. I used one millimeter distance between these two electrodes and this electrode with uh, platinum deposited inside this one and this was connected to the electrochemical deposition system and pulsed. So this is another view of the same. So the chemical compositions are like this and I, we again fine tuned this one, 21 volt 1 second pulses gave us the best results so that uh, carried the same set of experiments with this fabrication methodology. Then again uh, applied a um, small amount of across this one millimeter gap and it gave us uh, electroporosis deposition of these two material and after that we washed them in the PBS and this is the uh, response curve we got from that one and uh, again the same thing with the standard one and we got 325 milliampere per centimeter squared per mole. It's a huge improvement in the 
sensitivity <coughs> without using any templates so that you can use any so we got uh, this experimental adjusted pulse width and the number of pulses optimized the glucose oxidase deposition and we got cross-linking agent uh, under high electric field So this one gave us 0 to 60 millimole linear range. It's a huge one. You don't need this much for blood glucose measurement. Actually, this can be used as an industrial glucose sensor as well. Because if you have this one. More than enough for blood glucose measurements. This one can be used for industrial measurements as well. And this has a very high sensitivity of uh, 324 milliamperes per centimeter scared per mole and for this class of a nano biosensor this is a real good uh, result and I would like to thank my co-researchers uh, Dr. Malai Kanayaka and Professor K. Chikanato actually he is my postdoctoral supervisor and in fact this is my wife and he is a PhD supervisor so all these experiments were done at uh, Kyushu Institute for Technology and uh, before I joining uh, Central Queensland University and the under the Face Foundation and JSPS funding. Thank you so much and if you have any questions So the, these types of studies, we use a uh, blood, small blood portion from the Yeah. That blood portion, can we just pull our blood from what Yeah, yeah. You, you, usually, <laughs> it is taken as a representative sample of your blood. It may be different from place to place but very miniature difference. Uh, 3.5 something else, it's not possible. This is actually one aspect of nanotechnology and uh, another research project I did was developing nanotechnology based artificial muscles unfortunately there is no enough time so that's one another application and other universities other research groups doing a lot of uh, nanotech based uh, drug development and drug delivery methods so for example for small children uh, vaccination is a big trouble and they use nano patches just touch Even an infant, infant cannot feel that anything penetrating the skin, so that just tapping that, it will deliver the drug without any pain. So that kind of things are happening in different labs, but not in our lab. You mean the drug is the nano part? No, the development tech uh, mechanism is the nano uh, structure. The right. drug is coming through that one. Okay. So drug is coming through that one. Yeah. And this has to be has to be loaded, yeah. Has to be loaded into that patch. Yep. I think uh skips uh waiting in publicity available. It's a long way long way away <laughs> because safety clearance safety clearance from health authorities. First we had to do the lab testing, then the non-human testing trials, then only you can put it for the clinical trials.
No. I am not interested about patenting because it's huge money. And again, it's a double day lock. If you leave the institution, you can't get it, they can't use it. I think it's much, and, and until we come to a very fine tuned product, it's always good to publish them so that the whole research comes. Is a major problem for West. Yeah. I think there's no difference if you take Colombo. <laughs> it's it's on the rise. But I think still our countryside is good. People are still walking. And we here in the cities usually too busy. Oh, I don't know whether it's too busy. We assume that we are too busy. <laughs> Any other table? Is it easy to get affected after the street? The state will just get this, they will start the plan. Uh, will, it, uh, get Will the patient get affected? No, no, the, 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 the reading get affected. If <clears throat> the strip sucks the blood. Yeah. Uh, so if there is some electrolytes piece on the face, will the reading get affected? Certainly, yes. Because it is meant to work for glucose and it knows how much blood it sucks into that particular volume and if you put some other spirit or something the calculation goes because it's pre-calibrated for that amount of blood and if you put another liquid into that part of that is filled by something else so definitely the calibration goes ahead. But isn't that uh, happening in the existing ships? You have to clean the skin uh, to bring the skin from the blood. I don't think so, but you, you can just clean it, clean your hand with the soap or something. But see, for all, there will be some other um, solution there. Yeah, yeah. You, 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 if it is an evaporatable kind of thing, <laughs> you just wipe it like and let it. Yes, yeah, so a spit kind of thing. It will get evaporated within two three seconds. Then only you prick it and get the blood. So I don't think that much of a. Work. At the moment, it's about the commercially available ones are usually is seven eight months to one year or so but what we did has nearly four months of good response and we tested up to seven months even in seven months it gave three percent of the original sensitivity so that I think we can improve that further but at least it should be around one year eight, eight months plus to be commercially successful otherwise because you need to have it in transport and stores and the results also varies with the time. The sensitivity varies. At least the time of the yes, yes. Yeah. But the thing is unless there is a mechanism for the machine to know how old this strip if the machine can come to know how old this strip is then it can do the correction by the algorithm that's why usually you get a uh, calibration chip has to be inserted into the machine in the older type of machines you have that but in the new new type of machines they say it doesn't change the strip doesn't 
deteriorate that often. That's why they said no calibration is needed. The early one is better. Mm. Early one is better. Of, I can't say early one is better, but early one address the problem in a different way. The new one has altered or changed the properties of the sensor strip itself so that you don't need it. So ultimately, for the user, it's the same. Oh, they said they use the BMI. Yeah. Not, not only uh, glucose, you need to measure your cholesterol content as well, and then your body size. The other things you don't need to spend. Then you know where you are, and the blood glucose level shows you that you are heading towards diabetes, type 2 diabetes. If you are doing the, this test frequently and keep your data, this algorithm will plot the graph and give you the trend and predict you. If you go in this lifestyle, you will be heading this level in this many months. So that it's a pre warning that you can change the things if you want. Have a controller and program it. Only thing is, if the sensitivity is high, you get a higher current or voltage. But if the sensitivity is low, then your resolution of the AD converter is higher. That increases the cost. That's why we need to go increase the sensitivity so that you can go for a cheaper uh, electronics. What is the difference between LED and OLED? LEDs normally use. Uh, Standard conducting, uh, sorry, semiconductor materials like uh, silicon or uh, germanium, but oil LEDs are the organic LEDs. They are made up out of uh, organic. P dot PSS, the kind of chemicals they use for oil LEDs. The advantage is. These ones, once it's made, it's fit for the shape. You can't roll it, you can't bend it. But the oil it is, you can print it on a surface so that you can twist it, roll it. In, I believe in within five years or so, you will get roll-up screen type TVs. You don't need to have a big stand. You can just hang it on, pull it, and watch the TV, and push it back and roll it up. Solar cells, as well, for example, dye synthesized solar cells, they use nanotechnology heavily to improve the effective conversion ratio, especially in the not outside, because these chemicals are not that strong against strong sunlight. But there are a lot of research happening in the nanotechnology world to recapture the light which we don't use. Say for example in this room we have so many tube lights and we use I use only this area and the walls and other things they just get light and getting wasted. What we are not using within inside the room that that's happening there. And a lot of people addressing that problem. That's why the nanotechnology coming handy. You can paint it, and 
you don't need to have a very thick panel type of uh, solar array. You can have something rollable or thing. Just pull it and it will do the job. Any other questions? Yes. Do you have any other questions? So what? Thank you for that. We have a small screen here as a token of participation. I request uh, ISL past president, engineer, coming from the group, all that. Uh, Thank you so much.